Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. I hope it's... Uh, yeah, I'll start the sentence again. I hope everyone is all right. I think I might have interrupted the intro music there. Sorry about that. <laughs> I think I was a little bit trigger happy with the mouse button there. But there we go. Uh, we did, before I started the theme tune, have about 12 people in the room, and now we're down to eight, uh, which is a little bit of a small number for a Sunday Night Live, but that's okay. We'll hang tough, and hopefully we'll build up to our regular kind of peak viewing figure, which is about 20, I think we're about 25, 26 normally. So hopefully we will not be low on numbers because there are no sports for anybody to be watching. So <laughs> if you guys are wanting to watch sports rather than me, you're out of luck, folks, because there is nothing. <laughs> there is nothing for anybody to be watching. So, um, but the first thing I need to do is the um, I need to uh, make mention of my good friend, Sean Aaron, who says, Johnny is cool and helps out. Thanks for everything you do with a $20 donation. Thank you very much. That is extremely cool and extremely kind, especially as, you know, times are hard right now. And the economy around the world has gone to a halt. And so, you know, it's people are going to be t uh, financially shorter than they would have been uh, at this time of year. So I appreciate every cent. I really do. And every penny. I really do. You know, they count so much. In fact, I, I would say that every panel, every panel, every penny counts probably double or triple uh, these days. So I really appreciate it extremely much. So you are all very, very kind. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Thank you, Mika. What? You don't like watching video game F1? I've played that game, actually. My kids have it. I'm not very good at it, but uh, uh, it's good fun, especially racing the kids. That's great fun. Very entertaining. It's a good way to, to kind of while away the time when you're in lockdown and nobody knows what day it is or what time it is even. Uh, so let's go and see who's here. Mike Neighbor is here. Sean was the very first one in the door. Thank you, Sean. Uh, then Mike comes in and is keeping order whilst I was going and making my cup of tea ready for the show. Uh, let's see, Dwayne is here, Thomas is here, and Ken and Lowens. Sunday again and still no sports. Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, Sean says, I took two months off of songwriting and then wrote three songs inspired by the current times. And you posted them on your channel. Sean, I will be sure to check those out. Absolutely. Uh, but that's great that you've been being... Sorry, just adjusting my chair a little bit. Uh, it's really cool that you've been being wickedly creative and you've um, written three songs um, about what's going on at the moment. That's really, really in inspiring and encouraging to hear that. Just Bob is here. Kyle is here. James Geo is here. And, of course, Bobby Booth. No show is complete without Bobby being here. And Daryl Hunter is here as well. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, Ken says Trump just started a press conference, so some may be getting some info. That's fair enough. Yeah, I appreciate that. We had ours a little bit earlier. In fact, we had Her Majesty the Queen address the nation, which doesn't happen very often. In fact, it is in her entire reign, and she is the world's longest reigning monarch. And in her entire reign, she has only ever addressed the nation, I think, four times, maybe five times. I think this is the fifth time she's ever addressed the nation. So it doesn't happen very often. Uh, so it was a bit of a one-off. And then, of course, our Prime Minister Boris Johnson, he has coronavirus. And he's been kind of self-isolating um, in a room in uh, Number 10 Downing Street, which is the Prime Minister's office and official office and residence. Uh, so he's been self-isolating there and uh, just today was admitted to hospital. So um, executive power now passes to the deputy prime minister, which I believe is Dominic Raab, of all people. He was a very, very fascinating 
character. I think that's the only way I could describe him. But anyway, so that's kind of our situation, and uh, I'm aware that uh, things are, are um, you know, things are pretty tough over in the United States. I need to remember to turn off the audio for notifications, and I forget every darn time. I need to get to... I need to get used to that, because on Windows 7, I never had that issue. <coughs> As you can hear, um, I do have a better voice than I had last week. That is for sure, but there is still a lot of congestion there. Um, but the good news is, it is definitely not coronavirus. It is just regular flu, and in and uh, on this particular occasion of having flu, which I don't get very often, I am fighting my butt off to try and kick this thing, and it's not going anywhere. Edgar Price with a five dollar donation. Thank you very much, my friend. He says you are always there with an answer to my questions. Thank you. Well, you are very welcome. You are absolutely very welcome. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure to serve. Absolutely. Mika says, I remember him boasting about shaking hands irrespective of the quote-unquote hoax. Look at him now. Well, you know, yeah, that's all I'm going to say about that because this is not a political show. <laughs> but yes, <laughs> excellent point and very well made. That's about as far as I will go with that tonight. So, um, as you may well be able to see, in fact, I, you kind of can. You may have noticed that another... Uh, Keyboard and mouse have appeared over on this desk over here. You can't quite see what is a little bit out of shot. But I have a Mac. Can you believe it? <laughs> yes, I have a Mac. Um, and the reason why I have the Mac is for uh, support purposes, so that I can do my job um, and I can work with people that are Windows users and people that are Mac users. Now, uh, I have used Macs before. I've never owned one, but I have used them. Pretty much every school I've ever taught in has had Macs. And uh, so I've had to become familiar with them. And, you know, most studios I've ever worked in have had Macs. So I've had, I've had to learn how, you know, bare bones basic they work, to be honest. So... Um, it's good to finally get one, uh, uh, you know, after all of these years. And yes, Ken, you saw that in my picture. Yes, I, uh, I posted a picture on my personal Facebook page. If you uh, are a Facebook friend, you will have seen that. Uh, and it's basically just an updated shot of my, of my studio with the new Mac. Uh, and I'm, you know, getting familiar with it. It's uh, not my ideal preferred operating system, I'll be honest with you. But, you know, a lot of people use Macs, and a lot of people use Macs for audio. And so I need to be able to navigate my way around when I'm supporting people. So i got to get good at it. So, um, yeah, so there you go. I have a Mac in the studio now. Uh, my main machine is Windows. But I'm going to be working with that guy over there as well. Kyle with the $5 donation as well. Thank you so much. He says, keep learning us stuff and stay safe. Well, I will endeavor to do exactly that. During this weird, wacky time, I intend to keep on pursuing um, making the best educational content for Studio One and Personas Gear that I can possibly make. Uh, on this channel, on my website, and anywhere else that I can make personas um, orientated educational content, um, I will definitely be doing that. And Ken Moss with also a $5 donation. Thank you very much. You are all very, very kind, you guys. Thank you so very much. Um, Just Bob says, the good thing about this situation is that we are not being bombarded with crappy remakes and overall crappy movies that Hollywood has been pumping out. Well, yes, there is that. There is definitely some truth in there, for sure. It is a little unfortunate that um, production has not wrapped on the new James Bond film. 
because of coronavirus. They've had to put that on hold and hopefully they will get to that soon and we'll have a, a proper launch of that movie because it does look really good and I know people that are working on it. <laughs> I have personal friends that are working on it. Um, a couple of my friends are in the stunt team and uh, at least one of my friends is the is the audio one of the audio engineers recording the film score and mixing it and all of that and uh, doing some orchestrations. So, uh, you know, I, I, I know people that are involved in it and it's it's amazing. And so it would be nice if they actually get to see their work, um, uh, you know, getting to the silver screen. Um, Bobby Biz says, I'll stay with my PC. Besides, I can't afford a Mac. Yeah, well, you know what? I otherwise could not afford a Mac either, to be really honest with you. Um, <coughs> you know, if I had not got my new job, I would probably not have a Mac because they are very, very expensive, especially if you need one for audio, you know, you are talking, you know, anything between 3000 and 5000 for a Mac pro or an iMac or something like that that's going to be sufficient for what you need. I mean, it obviously depends upon kind of orchestral libraries or sound libraries and that kind of thing that you run. Not everybody needs those kind of libraries, but some, some of you will do. And if you are in that position where you need to use those libraries to get your work done and, uh, you know, then something like, you know, a $4,000 Mac is going to be what you need. However, that said, you can make perfectly good quality audio mixes and masters and recordings on a Mac Mini that is not super spec'd out. You absolutely can. My good friend Graham Cochran has done it for, for 10, 15 years. So it can be done. You don't need a massively spec'd out computer to make, you know, to make good, high quality music. You really don't. You know, this is the era that we now live in. You know, you can easily spend, you know, 1500 yeah, 1500 to $1,800 probably on um, a computer and an audio system that is going to be sufficient for you to, um, you know, to make uh, good music. Um, but, you know, even if you have just a bare bones basic computer, you don't need to add a lot to that to, you know, you maybe only need to add 300 bucks worth of gear and, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, and you can absolutely make terrific music. So, you know, Money really should should not any longer be a bar to people being able to be creative. Sean says, that's what my step-granddad said. Nice, PC works for me. JG is how I got into Personas two years after I bought Studio One 2. Yes. Yeah, um, I've, I've used PCs for as long as I can remember. Uh, let's see. Mika says, I'll use whatever works, but to most people, Popular and proliferated doors are Pro Tools and Logic, so I've used Macs for a long while, know them inside and out. Yeah, you know, Pro Tools and Logic have been around for three decades. Uh, and they are as old as Macs are, to be honest. So that's a fair comment. Mika goes on to say, I have a Mac Mini Core Duo that runs Studio One very well. I have to mind the CPU intensive plugins like Waves. But they work great for remote recordings where there's power. Yeah, absolutely. Right, one second, folks. <clears throat> like I said, I'm still struggling with a cough, but I'm otherwise all right, really. And the good news is my wife is fine, and she's back out in the community as a midwife. But I tell you what, <laughs> when she goes out to work, she is like in almost full body armor. It's amazing what she has to wear um, these days to go out to work. And uh, my kids are in good health and they're fine. 
Uh, let's see, Snidely Whiplash is here. He says, I have an old Mac Mini i7 16 gig RAM that has done 60 or so tracks with no bouncing and plugins. No problems. Well, there you go, you see. You absolutely can do it with not that much in the way of um, specking out. Uh, you just have to use your limitations creatively. And, you know, I think Graham has covered that as well, using, you know, using limitations to not hinder you, but actually enable you to be wickedly creative. Uh, Snidely says, but I do use my PCI 7 more, um, that it is more powerful than, than the Mac Mini. Yeah, absolutely. Alrighty, folks. So we've had a nice little chat for about 15 minutes, which is great. Um, but we have a song that I would like to develop and I've got some good ideas and I've got some things that I've been thinking about. Um, and I must remember to turn off those darn notification sounds. And I... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, and I keep forgetting to do that. Uh, Mac Minis have very limited GPU. Yeah, they probably do. They probably do. But you can still get the job done, I would imagine. All right, so as I say, we have a song to, to get um, moved on to the next, the next thing. And I've already added a little bit. And I kind of ran out of time. Um, I was working on it this afternoon, and I kind of ran out of time a little bit. I wanted to kind of, um, you know, kind of get us a little bit further down the road before we did the next show working on this song. Um, and I kind of had to, had to stop because I had to look after my kids. So um, let's go and take a look at where we are in the song. So we are here, and you'll notice I've added um, an alto sax and some trombones as well. Trombones in three parts here. Um, and what I've done is I've decided to just kind of ramp up the tension a little bit in this B section on this C minor chord. And so there are some dissonances a little bit. The harmony gets a little bit spicy, but that's cool because spicy is cool. Spicy is the new cool, my opinion. Uh, and then we're, so what we're going to do is we're going to focus our attention on these two A sections here, the second A and then the repeat of A1. And we're going to use this alto and, and uh, trombone to kind of uh, provide some, uh, a little bit of question and answer between the trumpet tenor, the alto and trombone. So these two will be together and then these two will be together providing uh, answers and that kind of thing. Uh... Oh, yes, okay. Yeah, I don't have that mic. All I have is my line out volume. I don't actually have that. All I have is my, as you can see, just my little line out thing here. And this is all I have. Select playback device. I don't want to do, I don't want to touch that. If I can avoid it. So let's see. Maybe I need to do this. Maybe I need to do that. Maybe this will work. Going to system, go to notifications. Allow notifications to play sound. Let's turn that off. There we go. That's probably going to do it. And I probably ought to do that at the start of every show. Okay. <laughs> Note made. <laughs> turn off notification sounds before you start. Right click on the icons, says Mike. Right click on the icons. Hang on, let's move you. Uh, 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 uh. Didn't want that to open. Spatial sound off. Open volume mixer. Is that what you're talking about? And then turn system sounds. Where well, if we do that, we might uh, we might end up uh, turning off Studio One, and I don't want to do that. You might not be able to hear Studio One, so I'll just leave that at that. Uh, for now, and we won't worry about it because I've turned off notification sounds, um, but apparently not the Facebook ones. Okay, right, let's get to it.
So here's what we have so far. Here's the new bit. So what we're going to do is we are going to pay attention to this second A section and we're going to provide a little bit of call and response between the uh, the figures here. And then we're going to do, some, do something a little bit different with this second, the, the repeat of the first A section, if you know what I mean. So this A section here is meant to be kind of a little bit different. And then this one, because it's going to go into this C section, um is going to be a little bit different still. And then in this section, this is going to kind of be where we'll put our little solo section. Uh, and then we'll have a completely different sound going into... Um, that'll go behind the solo. I haven't quite decided which instrument's going to play the solo yet. Maybe the trumpet. I haven't really quite decided yet. Or maybe the trombone. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to think about that, but... We'll put in some uh, some tasty little, uh, maybe some muted trumpets, muted trombones maybe, playing like Sforzanzo, um, very close harmony, maybe. Some dissonances, because uh, this section here, uh, this section here, Uh, has basically got the guitar and the bass in it. And so we've thinned out the texture quite deliberately here uh, of the rhythm section. So this is going to be our contrast bit, and then we're going to bring this final A section back, and we'll dress it up with some extra harmony. And maybe some... Uh, we'll bring in the... We'll have everything in. We'll, we'll chuck the kitchen sink at this last A section, and then we'll stick a little, like, one bar or two bar ending on the end of this, and then we will be done with this, and then we'll mix it. Not that there's going to be a whole lot of mixing to do, because all of these are virtual instruments, which means they already sound pretty good. So, there you go. That's my intention here. So, let's, uh, let's go back to this, uh, to the beginning, and then we're going to have a little think about what we're going to do here in these call and response sections here. So I'm thinking with this little phrase, da, 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 we could have like a little answering phrase because uh, we're in G minor. So we've got to we've got to think G minor here. So that's kind of what we've got to think about. Is that um, this kind of uh, key center? So we want something kind of nice and because what we have in the melody here is fairly legato. There's lots of long notes. So maybe we should contrast that with little short staccato figures. Staccato being little short notes. So I don't know. Um, let's actually just loop this section just for a minute. And see what smacks us between the eyes. Dear God, Facebook is going absolutely bonkers! Yeah, 
Yeah, kind of something like that. Man, everything is going absolutely bonkers. Okay. I'm just going to put you back over to the screen here just for a minute because I need to go and take care of this nonsense. It's going on in Facebook land. And I'm going to do that by... Um... Is that the right one? I don't think that was the right thing to do. Hang on. Must be a button that just turns all of that nonsense off. Ah, turn off active, active status. Turn it off for all. There we go. Folks, I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so some little uh, staccato kind of figures, maybe a little bit higher up the up the instrument in the something like that. Something like that, and then we can double that maybe with the alto. Or maybe we could have the alto in fourths or something like that. So let's stick this in and see what comes up. In fact, no, we'll start right here. There we go. And uh, let's just have a listen to that for a second. All right, let's copy paste this up into the alto part Let's see what we can do with this alto part here. See if we can actually get some harmony going. So maybe if we were to select all and we can go to action and then we can go to transpose. Let's see what we're going to do. We're not going to do it down two octaves. Let's set that to that. Let's try, let's try that. Just, just for, no, that's not going to work. That's going to sound hideous. I'm pretty sure this is going to sound hideous. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Well, maybe not. And then we could make this last bit here in unison. So, this last bit here. Oh, 
I missed a note. We can transpose back up to go back to transpose and let's make this plus five. That's just zero. Oh, no, that's not what I wanted to do. I should have done plus five. I was right the first time. All right, let's, um, I don't want to do that. All right, I think that should do that. All right, let's just do a save. And let's see what you guys are talking about. Back over here. Let's see. Right click on, oh yeah, okay. Uh, Mike Neighbor says that sounds really good. Does anyone else think it needs to be sped up a little bit? Yeah, it might need to be. Yeah. We'll maybe think about that once we've fleshed out the arrangement a little bit more. Uh, let's see. Sean says it would be cool to hear a record scratch somewhere in the song. Yeah, actually, maybe not a bad idea. Tori Gray is here. Hello. Good to see you. <coughs> Excuse me. I was about to say welcome to the show. And then my throat got caught. Sample rates aren't matching. Uh, yes, they are. <laughs> yeah, this is a 44-1 session. So I don't know what you mean by sample rates aren't matching because everything works. Everything is correct. My audio uh, in Windows is set at 44.1. My interface is set at 44.1 in Universal Control. Studio One is set at 44.1. So. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. But that's cool. Not a problem. Alrighty, so what do you guys think um, of those staccato things? Do you think those are good? Um, I think I think that sounds pretty good. And I think it makes a nice little contrast between the first A and then the second A with a little bit of call and response between. And we're also introducing new uh, a new sound, a new instrument, um, but in keeping with the style of music that we're aiming for. Uh, wouldn't it be faster using uh, the cursor keys? Yeah, probably. I could probably do that um, for sure. And, you know, I could always bind things to uh, key commands, and I just haven't done that yet. But I certainly could do that for sure. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, I kind of have a, a, a very old-fashioned way of working in DAWs. I have a workflow that's probably hideously out of date, but it is just the way I've worked for, you know, 30 years. And I've got used to, to kind of fishing around for things in menus um, because menus have never really bothered me. Now, it, there's a lot of people that, you know, they have like everything literally under their fingertips uh, as key commands on a keyboard. I'm never going to remember all those. <laughs> I'm just not. It's just, you know, I'm not wired that way. Some people, they just go bink, 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 and like 50 things come up on the screen and, and then they make their edits and they hardly touch anything else. <laughs> I'm not that guy. <laughs> my neighbor says struggling to keep my boredom in check well i'm sorry if my show is boring you uh that is not the intention of the show but uh i think to some degree with um uh, being in lockdown and being stuck indoors i think that's definitely the case and being indoors is another one of these things that i was talking about earlier it's a limitation so what we need to do when we have limitations we can't go outside we can't go and and go into town, we can't go to a bar, we can't go to a pub, we can't go to a jazz club, we can't go to a cinema, we can't go to any of that kind of stuff. I can't even go down to the beach, I can't go for a walk in the Pentland Hills, I can't go up Arthur's Seat, I can't do anything like that. So, um, we have to engage our imaginations and think a little bit creatively about what we can do 
and how creatively we can push that envelope a little bit. So, yes. Uh, da, 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 Tori says it was me, sorry. Okay, yeah, no problem. Good, 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 good. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, Sean says, in the C-section, I'm thinking DJ record scratching and some guitar dive bomb accents. Can, can your guitar dive bomb? No, it can't. <laughs> it doesn't have a tremolo arm. And there's nowhere, to, there's nowhere on it to screw a tremolo arm in. It's not that kind of guitar. It's more of a jazz guitar, that. So, um, it's not really made for, uh, you know, kind of that kind of stuff. But I wonder if we can fake one. We might be able to fake one, possibly. Well, I, I, you know, I, I guess we'll kind of have to see how far we get. Maybe that'll be something that we add a little bit later on once we've kind of... I mean, those are kind of the icing things. At the moment, we're kind of dealing with the bare bones. Get, let's get the bare bones and the overall ingredients of the cake sorted first. And then once we've got all of that, then we can add, you know, the nice icing, we can add the nice decorations, we can add the cherry on the top and, you know, the, the beautiful little plastic or even marzipan married couple that stand on top of the, the cake and an arch with some edible leaves and that kind of stuff. We can do all of that. I'm pushing the analogy a little bit, but you know what I mean. We can add all of that once we've got the bare bones of the, of the song in the bag. Sean with $2. Thank you so very much. He says, these live streams are cool to hang out with. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. Thank you very much. I appreciate that so very much. It's very cool. So let's go back to our song and let's do the next wee bit. Let's do the next wee bit. Let's do the next wee bit. Uh, you probably didn't want to hear me sing that, but that's okay. All right. So we've got this. Let's listen to the whole thing from the beginning. Well, not the whole thing, but this kind of a, uh, second A section to B section transition. Uh, we'll turn off the loop for now. So now we're in this section here. Uh, what we need to do is we need to come up with um, a different set of phrases. So let's get the instrument loaded back in again. We need to think of a different set of phrases this time. But we don't want to make them too, too different. So... Maybe we should go for long tones, maybe? Yeah, maybe we could um, have the trombone split here into fourths, maybe. Yeah, something like that, maybe. And then we'll add uh, some altos on the top of it, I think. Here's what we'll do. Is let's get the loop off for a second.
Yeah, something like that. And let's add some altos to that. So let's get our loop back on so I can work out an alto part. Try that again. Yeah, why not? It's just a single outer on the top. Well, maybe I should add another one. Seems we've got the seems we've got the the two trombones. Maybe we should have two altos. Wow, that vibrato is seriously 1930s. Yeah, maybe thirds on the top. Just for fun. I did the I did it backwards and then it should be something like that something like that Let's stick it in. See if we see if we like it. We can always change it. Something like that. And then we'll go into this C section with uh, something slightly different sounding. All right, what do you guys think so far? What do you guys think so far? Uh, transition sounds cool. Cool, nice. Thank you, Tori, with the uh, nine ninety nine donation. I appreciate that very much. You are awesome. Uh, do do so buttercream icing. Yes, it is quite correct. Just Bob says for the second A, I'd put an eighth note descending xylophone. Think Doors Riders on the Storm. High A for some auditory pop. Yep, maybe we could certainly do that. Uh, first sequence we worked on tonight. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Maybe octaves for the last two short notes on the altos. Uh, yes. Instead of the thirds. Yeah. Why not? I think that's a good idea, actually. Yep. We could, or we could go and change that. That's easy enough done. So let's go and, let's go and edit that. Instead of the thirds at the end, because everything else is thirds. 
Uh, come on, why are we not zooming? Oh, for goodness sake. What's going on here? That's better. Uh... So yeah, uh, it's a G minor chord, so yeah, why not just have G's instead? So let's take... Oh, that's trombones. We don't want to adjust the trombones, we want to adjust the altos. So... Why am I getting that sound? I'm on the alto part, this is weird. Okay, something funky is going on here. That's better. That's awful high for an alto, but we'll do it. Good work. Yeah, this one. These ones aren't really coming through very loudly, are they? we go give them a little bit more bite yep that's better gives them a little bit more impact good call good call and then what I'm thinking of doing is I'm thinking of adding in some different textures into this C section so I'm thinking adding in some muted trumpets, muted trombones, and get them playing some nice little dissonances. Um, and then we can have just a regular open trumpet taking the solo in this section. But that's probably where we're going to have to leave it for the song. We've got about 10 minutes or so, and I can take your questions. Uh, and we can, next week, we can come in and work on this section. Now that we've got everything else pretty much in the bag. So I think maybe that's what we should do. Uh, Ken says, yeah, I'm really liking this arrangement. Well, that's cool. Legato strings in the back would be good. I like that idea. Yes. Uh, Mike Never says, I think it sounds good. Not real good at writing horn parts. I've been writing horn parts for so long. Um, I've been writing horn parts since I was maybe about... 13, 14 years old. And, um, you know, it's, <coughs> it's something that you get better at the more you practice and the more you kind of learn how, um, the different instruments work in your horn section. Like, so you have to understand, first of all, the first thing you have to understand is the whole concept of transposing, which is, at first, it's quite tricky to get your head around, but once you understand how it works, then it becomes kind of second nature, and you just you just calculate it without thinking. So, and it's not really mathematics, to be honest, but it, it kind of is at the same time, but it's really simple. So, um, the best way to think of it, particularly with a standard horn section of trumpet, alto sax, tenor sax, trombone, and you know you can you can add into that a baritone saxophone but we won't for this so if we're talking a standard four piece horn section the trumpet sounds a tone below what is written so it's a b flat instrument we and by that we mean that it's it's kind of starting note is a b flat whereas a piano is is you know the starting note for a piano is a c and uh, it's so it's 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 in what we call concert pitch, um, and then you know brass instruments and some woodwind instruments they all are designed in different keys. So what you have to do is you have to um, basically when you're writing a chart for these four instruments is you have to correct for their 
transpositions for the keys that they are in. So when you're writing a, for a trumpet, you want to write a tone above the note you want to come out of the instrument. So if I want a trumpet player to play a D, then I need to write a tone above that, which is going to be an E. All right. A tenor sax is also a B flat instrument, but it is an octave below that. So um, essentially the transposition for a tenor sax is a ninth. So um, the same kind of transposition applies for a trumpet, except you are adding in a whole a whole octave to that. So it's an octave and a tone. So if I want my tenor sax here to play this note here, I have to write the the E um, a ninth above. So you get that instrument that interval instead. So that so if I want that sound to come out of a tenor sax, I have to write that on the chart, and then the tenor sax player fingers that note accordingly, and what comes out is the note that I want. Uh, alto sax is an E flat instrument, so this means the correction is a major sixth. All right, so this is the this is the interval. So if I want an E flat on an alto sax, I need to write the C above that E flat. And if I want him to play an F, then I have to write a D above. So I write this, and he plays that. All right, so that's the case for um, an alto sax. You have to write up a major sixth because you're compensating for the fact that it's an E-flat instrument and not a C instrument. In a, um, in a jazz or popular music context, the trombone is a concert pit in pitch instrument. You don't need to transpose for it. Okay? But in a brass band context or an orchestral context, it is a B-flat instrument. It is just a different way of reading for those contexts and all trombone players are taught both ways so it is just what it is ken says can you explain the theory of the fourths and how that fits in with the chord um it's is it for more of a jazzy sound yeah fourths come from <coughs> a a concept which we call in theory, music theory, we call it Gregorian modes. It comes from uh, Gregorian plain song of the Middle Ages. So we're kind of talking the 13th century. These modes were kind of developed. And then throughout um, the late Romantic period, so we're talking the 19th century, towards the beginning of the 20th century, modes started to come back into vogue and classical composers from who are writing in that period, so kind of late Beethoven and uh, and um, gosh, my mind has gone blank for for names of of composers from that post that sort of late Romantic period. They all started appropriating these modes and bringing them in to their music and basically using the scale because that's what a mode is. It's a scale and using the notes from that scale to create harmony. So basically taking the original major minor tonality system that we base chords out of. So when we're talking about a G chord, a D chord, a C chord, an E minor chord, an A minor chord, all of that is based out of a major minor tonality. And Gregorian modes uh, are not based on that at all. They're based on a fixed, a fixed eight note scale. And so you would, you basically, with that eight note scale, you make your melody and your harmony out of those notes. So you don't need to think in terms of chords anymore. You're thinking just purely in terms of making those uh, sounds from those available notes. So this means that you can build chords out of stacks of fourths. And you hear this in Miles Davis's music from the 1950s. In particular and, and Stan Getz as well you'll find it in his music as well Stan Kenton the the um, the uh, 
big band arranger who basically fused post-romantic mu uh, classical music con uh, ideas and concepts and brought those into the, the jazz big band world. And he kind of fused those two things together very, very effectively. He was greatly influenced by people like Tchaikovsky, Ravel, Debussy, uh, you know, uh, early 20th century classical composers like that. And uh, he fused those ideas into uh, jazz big band arranging. And so he made a lot of use of modes. Uh, but yeah, you hear it a lot in, for example, Miles Davis's So What? You know, after you, you have the bass melody, the answer is in the horns, and you get this. And that kind of thing. And what that basically is, is a stack of fourths. Oh, hang on. It's a stack of fourths with a, a, the interval of a major third on the top of it. That is all derived from a mode that we call the Dorian mode. All the modes have a Greek name. So this is the Dorian mode, and that's basically the white notes from D to D. And that's your fixed scale. So you need to make your harmony and your melody out of those chords. And so quite often in that kind of context, you want to avoid intervals like major thirds, although sometimes they're useful to stack on on top of a group of uh, a, a stack of fourths and so you can get some really interesting sounds I mean there's one really interesting sound for a start because if you start stacking fourths what you find uh, let's, let's say we start here with a G, a C and an F move that up one that sounds like fourths so does that the next one sounds a little bit weird. Why? Because we have a, we have an augmented fourth or a diminished fifth, depending upon your outlook in, on life, on the top of it because of how the scale is built. And then here, here we have that interval again. So you're going to come up against this kind of augmented fourth kind of interval as well at times. And that's kind of what makes what makes that music sound distinctive and as you say Ken it sounds jazzy. And you can you can work those kind of modal stacks of fourths kind of concepts into popular music. I do it all the time. Even in a major minor kind of tonal setting, I do that a lot. For example, if somebody writes me a chart and they want me to play, you know, kind of uh let's say um they want me to play uh, something in kind of A flat major, let's see. And it's like lots of major sevenths. Now, I could do this. There's kind of like a third inversion A flat major chord. There's the A flat, there's the major seven, there's the third, there's the fifth. So I could go. That's kind of nice, but that's not how I would think about it. I would think about it in terms of a stack of fourths over this A flat. So I would use the G, this, the C, and the F, and you get this nice sort of A flat major six kind of sound. And then when I get to this C minor, this C minor chord, I would maybe do this. And then for the D flat. Well, there's a lot of things I could do here, is I could play, uh, let's see, I could play, I could have the G, the sharp 11 in there, the major 7 and the 3rd, sounds a little ugly in that kind of voicing, it still has that kind of nice 4th kind of sound, but instead of playing it open, I might close it a little bit and have, and have that kind of sound instead, I like, ma I like major 7s with a sharp 11. There's your 11 chord again, so...
So I'm not really thinking about major chords and minor chords in that kind of a context. I'm thinking modes. I'm thinking we're in A flat. Uh, I'm not even thinking an A flat major scale. I'm thinking of an A flat Lydian scale. There, D natural instead of D flat. That's kind of what I'm thinking in that context. Obviously, I can't use the D natural on a D flat major chord, so I have to adjust it slightly. But for the most part, that's kind of what I'm thinking about. Sharp 11s. Which, by the way, is the same scale as the F Dorian scale. So in the context of an A-flat major piece, F Dorian works very, very nicely. So I can build my chord voicings out of a mode without really having to think about the, uh, uh, you know, kind of the harmonic structure of, of the piece. And it means I'm not thinking about chords. I'm just thinking about playing pretty voicings. And so that's kind of a lot of what I do when I'm doing piano charts for people. You know, say somebody says, I have this R&B track and they want some kind of loungy kind of piano or Fender Rhodes kind of thing going on it. Then that's that's kind of what I do. I, I don't even ask for a set of chord changes. I just kind of listen to what's going on and then I just find a mode that fits all of their chord changes. And that's what I do. Kind of works most of the time. <coughs> so I hope that answers that question, Ken. Sorry, that was quite a long answer. Billy Morgan is here. He says, good evening, everybody. Uh, let's see. Ken says, wow, that's why I love this show so much. Always learning something amazing. Well, you're very welcome. And I'm glad I could help. Tori said, I had this jazzy loop that didn't work. Come out the way I need it it to and now I just didn't understand the scale or mode and I and now I know I just didn't okay gotcha gotcha I might need to send me a recording of that <laughs> <coughs> I don't even remember what I played <laughs> but yeah another thing I like to do uh, in that kind of context is things like this Which is basically just kind of C minor 11, uh, B7 flat 5, B minor 11, A7 flat 5, resolving to that nice A flat major kind of sound. And then I like to do this. There's your sharp 11, resolve that to the third. That always sounds nice. Especially if I stick the 13th on the top of this A7 flat 5 chord. And then I can resolve that there. And then finally resolve that major third. So those are always great fun to muck about with. And, you know, I mean, basically this is, this is the result of 35, nearly 40 years of just mucking about at a piano and kind of finding, hey, that sounds pretty. And that's kind of the way I roll, man. Totally. And yeah, you, you're you right. It kind of sounds pretty smooth when you play it like that. It's just like smooth as the smoothest peanut butter you've ever spread on your toast. Absolutely. Um, you know, that's kind of one side of me. The other side of me is kind of really spiky, spicy dissonances. And I do that a lot. Um, you know, when I worked with my band... Uh, and, uh, you know, um, I'd have my trio and then we'd, we'd have like a guest um, soloist who'd come and play with us. And so I had this alto sax player who was awesome, incredible alto sax player. Amazing alto sax player. And I was playing uh, my Nord, actually, rather than my Fender Rhodes. I, you know, this is just easier to carry about. So um, I had this and I was playing it kind of on the Fender Rhodes setting. And... Uh, you know, we were just kind of like jamming away around the blues. I think we were, what were we playing on? We were playing on uh, Miles Davis's All Blues. You know, the, the one that has the... It has that kind of uh, bass thing going on. 
And so we were playing on that. And so, so I mean, the approach to the blues in this particular case, the Miles Davis tune, is very modal. So it's all based around uh, G mixolydian, which is G to G on the white notes of the piano. And so, you know, we're playing that. And uh, I just kind of decided, this is kind of my humor coming out. I decided I was just going to try and throw off our alto player as much as I could by playing as spicy chords as I could get away with. So I did. I played lots of really dissonant chords um, and big, wide, open voicings. You know, I did things like this. Uh, and stuff like that, um, just to basically try and throw him off. And sometimes I'd do this. You know, kind of weird sounding stuff like that. So that's kind of like the other side of me, which is stuff that's kind of a little bit experimental and improvisational. And I love doing that stuff. All right, so where are we up to? Uh, uh, who's this? Uh, is that Sem or Kim? I'm not really sure. Uh, who says, you know what Miles said to Herbie, don't play the butter notes. Yes. And there's another great thing that um, Herbie actually said about Miles. And I'm going to finish the, the show with this because it is such a cool little story. And I hope it really helps you with your music making. So Herbie was playing with Miles and they were playing in Germany in 1961, 62, something like that. And uh, they were playing on one of Miles' tunes. I don't recall which tune it was. But as they were playing, Herbie played the wrong chord. He just, his fingers just landed in the wrong place on the piano. And it was just totally a chord that just didn't fit anything that was going on in the, in the music at that moment. Herbie was just like, oh my gosh, I've just, you know, I've goofed. I've, I've, I've messed it up. I played something horrible. Miles didn't see it that way. In that moment, Miles picked out a few of the notes that he could pick out from what Herbie had played on the piano. And he used those as a vehicle for imp improvising. He made a little phrase out of some of those notes that Herbie had played on the piano. And Miles, therefore, made what Herbie did right. Even though Herbie thought that it was wrong and it didn't fit, and it certainly didn't fit the, you know, the kind of the chord changes as, as they were going by. But Miles made what Herbie did correct by taking some of the notes that Herbie had played and using them to improvise on. And uh, that taught Herbie a big lesson about thinking about it's not really about what's right and what's wrong it's about what sounds good and in that moment miles thought okay i wasn't expecting that but that's the nature of the beast that's the nature of improvisational music is that sometimes you can throw something in that nobody's expecting and then you know the challenge for the improvising musician is to make something out of that you know all that miles heard was hey this is different material i can use that and that's what miles did so when they came off the stage herbie said to said to miles hey man i'm, I'm sorry I, I i messed that up i played totally the wrong chord and um miles just kind of grinned at, at herbie and uh, he smiled at herbie and, and said you just gave me new material man and that was it. That was the way Miles saw it. And that taught Herbie a massive lesson about, you know, being creative in the moment. And sometimes that has challenges attached to it. So, in a sense, in music, there really is no right or wrong. There's what fits really well and what's maybe a little bit discordant and sometimes downright super spicy. But in that context, even if it is really spicy, just sounds like it doesn't fit. You can create something out of it that makes it fit. 
So, you know, don't be in a hurry to delete the, the wrong notes that you play sometimes. Or you, you think you play something wrong on a take. Don't be in such a hurry to delete it. Think about what you've heard and the context in which you've heard it. Or the context in which you played it. And think about what can I do with that rather than, yeah, that's wrong, I should delete it. You know, try and use everything that you have, everything that happens in the moment creatively. So there you go. That's kind of what I'm going to finish with. That's my application of that little anecdote between Miles and Herbie Hancock. So I hope that helps. And we've made it to about quarter past one, which is awesome. Uh, I'm going to go to bed now <laughs> <coughs> because it's that time of night. And uh, I will see you all. Uh, hang on, let me get that ready because I'm hopelessly not ready tonight. Um, so I will see you all on Wednesday for Songwriting Simplified over on Johnny Gives' channel. Looking forward to that. And Dave Vignola and I will be doing another live stream again at some point, perhaps this week. Need to look at our schedules and see what we can fit in. Um, but should be good. Those sessions that uh, Dave and I do are always really good fun. So uh, keep an eye out for those things. Dave will be advertising it. Um, I'll be plugging it when I can. I am very, very busy at the moment with, with work at Presonus. There's lots going on, none of which I can talk about in any way, shape or form. So I'm not going to. Um, and so, yeah, there's just lots going on. It's It's a busy time. It's a busy time of year. It's kind of Easter time. Easter's always busy. Uh, so, you know, it's incredible. It's incredible. It really is. And I'm learning loads because I'm having to do like and, and learn new systems that I've just never used before. So that's kind of what's making it most busy for me. I will see you all on Wednesday over on Johnny Gibes channel. And then we'll be back here again on Sunday for another Songwriting Simplified. Uh, Songwriting Simplified is on Wednesday with Johnny Gibe. We'll be back here for Sunday Night Live. And I'll maybe do, I'll maybe pop up and do another couple of random extra special lives as well. So see you then, folks. Good night. Good night, everybody.